morning, everyone. I'm Rebecca Shaw. I'm the director of the Days the Same Museum, and I wish to welcome you to our lecture, Lynn Evola, The Peace Angels Project. A big thank you needs to be expressed to Kristen Kasanovich. Kristen is at the back of the room, senior lecturer in the Department of Theater and Dance and the Liberal Studies pre-teaching program here at Santa Clara University, who is responsible for bringing this presentation to all of you. It was just over six months ago when Kristen invited Lynn to participate in a class she was teaching here, and a long-term relationship and collaboration was born. I would like to acknowledge and thank the Santa Clara University program sponsors who made today's presentation possible. The, day, the Department of Art and Art History, College of Arts and Sciences, Theater and Dance Department, Justice and the Arts Pathway, and the Day Society Museum. A special thanks to Phyllis Brown and Laura Nichols, the directors of the core curriculum who support interdisciplinary teaching activities such as this one. The Peace Angels Project seemed to be the perfect fit for a Jesuit Catholic institution grounded in social justice values. This globally situated project marries science, ethics, cutting edge technology, art, craftsmanship, entrepreneurship, politics, diplomacy, and law enforcement. Not to mention our best kept secret that Lynn attended Santa Clara University for three years studying art here prior to completing her bachelor's and master's degrees at the San Francisco Art Institute. It is now my pleasure to introduce Derek Cabanas, managing member of Reverie Arts in San Francisco, who exclusively represents Lynn Evola's work. Being a gallerist and private art dealer, for the past 13 years himself, he has represented one of the foremost American contemporary artists, Hunt Slolom. In 2014, Reverie Art San Francisco will open with an inventory in excess of $40 million, representing 18 artists through their strategic partnership with Amazon Art. Future expansion cities will include West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and Palm Desert. Without further ado, let's welcome Derek Cabanas, who in turn will introduce Lynn. Thank you much, Rebecca. Um, I'm okay? Good morning. Thank you all for coming out uh, this early morning. And I promise my introduction will be very short so we can get you to um, hear the person that I am here to introduce and very honored to represent uh, my friend, uh, the artist of Ebola. Then came to me about uh, 18 months ago when she first met me with this incredible project that she started in the early 90s. And, and it was very appropriate at that time to, to hear this project and meet this individual who has such compassion and conviction for what she does. Um, I am sure that there will be plenty of questions at the end of this, but without further ado, I would like to introduce my friend, the artist Linda Bowen. So, Christmas Eve, 2011, I was in the Hamptons with some good friends who had um, me over for the night, you know, overnight. We had lots of time to talk at the end of dinner. And I was explaining to this host why the Peace Angels Project costs millions and millions and millions. And he kept arguing with me. He couldn't even understand how a house could be built with the same amount of money. A 
until he realized that I went to Santa Clara University. As soon as he realized I was educated by the Jesuits, he said, why didn't you tell me? If you had told me you were educated by the Jesuits, I would have understood. I said, right, I have to do it, I have to do it right. And the Jesuits taught me one thing that was beyond value. They taught me how to think. The way it was when we went to school, if you got the right answer, but you couldn't defend it, you still flopped. They didn't care. And they really didn't care, boy or girl, if you couldn't defend it. The back of the line was just fine. And to me, I was mesmerized. I looked up so many words in the dictionary that the foreign students wanted to know what country I was from. <laughs> but I enjoyed it so much because I got to be an artist. Something I had done when I was two years old. In the old tag neighborhood in Chicago, I was drawing all the time. I had this book. My mother, you know, didn't know what to do with me. Nobody really knew what to do with me. Because all I wanted to do was make art. So fast forward to 1971, my best friend is here from college. I'm so happy to see her. I had to learn. I had to learn everything I could get. And I took every single art class that I ever, I think that they ever offered here. But it was a unique time period at Santa Clara University. The head of the painting department had been newly transplanted from New York City, Father Gerald Sullivan. And he taught not only what art was, art appreciation, he had art history class, he had this pattern, but he taught anatomy. He taught how to draw. And I had the guts to go up to him and ask him if he would tutor me one-on-one. -on because -one. I knew I had to go there. I had to find out the very, very, very most difficult things. The other teacher that really, really influenced me was Paul Cobbs. Very famous, if you don't know who he is, look him up. Very famous California conceptual artist. One of the best. So between the ideas of the Paul Cobbs and the actualization of training from Father Joe Sullivan, you had to learn something. You really, you really couldn't get away with that, learning something. And what Paul Cobbs taught me was that the idea was everything. What Joe Sullivan taught me was the idea was nothing <laughs> unless you could actualize it. So, this was the bedrock, and this is what answered the question of my friend in the Hamptons when he said, okay, I got it. You have to do this right. I said, right. So Father uh, Stephen Olivo was my uncle. God bless his heart. He was my favorite relative of my life. When I was born, he was my babysitter. But when I was 21 years old, getting into lots of trouble, he saved my little butt. He brought me directly to a place called Santa Clara University. And he was magic. Here I learned from Father O'Toole, who turned out to be one of the top philosophers of our time. Sorry. Yeah, no. Father Fallon was the philosopher. Father O'Toole taught English, sorry. And then the other teachers that we just spoke so going on with that training and writing the Peace Angels Project uh, became very tough because when I began to write it, I realized that there wasn't a normal person on earth who wouldn't question my motives and wouldn't wonder what the heck I was doing. To melt down weapons, how was I going to get these weapons? Who would bother to give me weapons, right? And I took two years after an, a very inspirational experience. And my son, he's here today. Love my son, right? Um, I found out that a thousand children were being killed every year in Los Angeles County. I can still hardly say those words without crying. 
the love I have for my son, it's not possible that I could even figure out how to live if anything happened to him. I couldn't understand how all these parents lost their children. It changes worlds, it changes whole neighborhoods, it changes cities. How do you do that and carry on? I couldn't, um, I couldn't help myself. God gave me huge talent I can't take credit for. It. I can take credit for working my ass off, sorry. You know, I have, but I cannot take credit for the talent. And so I felt that was a great responsibility, that I should take that talent and then put some muscle behind it and maybe a little bit of the brain cells that the Jesuits tough, 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 <laughs> honed into me. And that's how I wrote the Peace Angels Project. It took two years. And I figured that if I wrote it, I could at least go out humbly speaking and meet with governments, gang members, law enforcement, scientists, technical people, and find out if I could actualize this. And it was hard. My good friend Nancy Evanson sitting here, knew me during those beginning times. It was very, very difficult. And being an artist who loves my craft, I also had to make sure that the art that I did was worthy to hold the energy of such a thought. Remember, Father Jerry Sullivan, Paul Collins. <laughs> so the Renaissance Peace Angel, which is now owned by the September 11th Museum, became the very, like one of the first sculptures I ever did in my life. I never took a sculpture class. I missed that whole thing. It was too dirty. So I took all these beautiful sculptures with absolutely no confidence in myself but just felt that that was the only way that I could capture the idea. If I was going to go to these people and ask them for weapons, I better have a really good idea what I was going to do with them. So I went to the best boundaries I could find at the time uh, in Berkeley and worked on the Renaissance Peace Angel. <coughs> worked on the Africa Peace Angel. Worked on different things, sorted out how I was going to create different environments. Um, how would I find a site? Who would put a sculpture there? These became questions that were unanswerable, but at least I knew the trajectory. This sculpture was unveiled by Archbishop Tutu in Wilkesburg Fellowship Center, where it now exists. Um, excuse me, it was unveiled at the Premier Museum in Johannesburg but then now lives in Lewisburg. That's the place where thousands of lives were saved in South Africa. It's a funny story about that whole thing. I was in my little apartment in Los Angeles, and my son, you know, was at school, and I had this appointment. Again, humbly speaking, really, you know, meeting with these people. <coughs> and I had this appointment with a man um, who was Reverend Dale White, Episcopalian, he had a stroke. <coughs> so when he came into my apartment and pulled his suitcase, he turned around and he just started crying. He was in his early 70s, late 60s, not that old. And I asked him to sit down, gave him some water. I said, what's, what's the matter? He said, Lynn, for 30 years I've been looking for the spirit of Africa. And and he just happened to be best friends with Archbishop Tutu. He taught Archbishop Tutu how to read um, ancient Greek up in the bell towers when it was illegal to teach black people how to read. Stunning. So this was 1998, 99, 2000, 2000. All the way to 2003, I get invited to South Africa. And I get there, I said, what did it take so long? You guys have been like a house on fire. You couldn't wait to, you know, do this peace angel. What took you so long? I said, well, then, you're white, you're female, and you're American. And nobody wanted you. And then they couldn't find anybody else. I think that was one of the best compliments I've ever received in my life. 
And now that Peace Angel stands in Lotus Fruit, where so much tragedy happened, and so much life was saved, and that's Peace Angel. There it is, that simple figure of African Peace Angel. The Peace Angels Project invites people to give up weapons. So that always goes through law enforcement, always through government. I don't get anything until we have huge weapons destructions. Um, 2009, Sheriff Baca got tired of me saying, you know, wait, I'm not sure when you know, we're going to take the weapons. So he brought together half the state, the lower half of the state of California, law enforcement, and insisted on having a huge press conference. And what they did is they gave me a thousand weapons, but before then, they decided what they were going to do was read me a list, read everyone a list, of who was given these weapons. And he spent, I don't know, maybe a good solid 10 minutes reading all the law enforcement agencies that were giving the weapons for the peace I mean, I could hardly breathe, because I, I think it's a good idea to do this. I really do. But to get such huge accolades, respect, and trust, it's very difficult to do. Because of him, six months later, Commissioner Kelly was even more difficult to get to than um, the mayor of New York, decided that he was going to do the same thing since Los Angeles did it. Now New York was going to step up, and they gave us a thousand weapons. Not to get left behind, six months after that, the LAPD with helicopters, SWAT, there's lots of pictures of this, um, gave me 10,000 weapons. Then the US government, who I can't really tell you exactly who or how or what department, because it's confidential, um, gave me 100 barrels of nuclear stains. Now we're in business. It took almost 15 years, but now we're in business because the one promise I made to myself in that tiny little apartment in San Anselmo, <laughs> I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna do it right. So that meant real weapons from real agencies every time. When I met with the president of the Balkans after the war, they offered me the Museum of Contemporary Art, they said, you know, we really want to have this sculpture here. It means everything to us as we re rebuild our city. And then he asked me a very peculiar question. He said, how is Los Angeles? Like it was a person. And I, I thought it was a translator, you know, because I don't speak anything except art and then English. And I said, well, um, I don't know which, what do you mean? And he said, well, the deaths, the deaths of the children. Now I was really freaked out because I couldn't understand really at all what he meant by that. He said, we are experiencing this ourselves now because all the people that have been attacked and killed, and you know, the story is a horrible story in the Balkans, um, decided they were going to protect themselves. So they would put their own weapons in cabinets and the children would find them and kill each other. They were losing their own children. So when he was asking me how was Los Angeles, I thought, it was like a person, right? Um, now we're talking about countries and cities like people that are losing massive, 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 massive change. So, of course, when I love it happened, and my husband at the time, Dan and Peabody Smith, fantastic, man. Um, was also, he was a businessman, a philanthropist, a real sharp guy. And he decided he was going to get the Peace Angel from California, the Renaissance Peace Angel we saw a few minutes ago. And he brought it and had it planted right in front of Nino's restaurant where they fed the fire and police officers and rescue workers. And he thought everybody should know what a Peace Angel was. Except nobody wanted to know what a Peace Angel was because if you brought up the word peace, they were going to put you in a garbage can. It's not the time to talk about Nevertheless, this 
agriculture is that it's now owned by the September 11th Commission. So people like Michael Bloomer wrote me letters about how appeasing was the anger <coughs> to 9-11 in Congress. And people started to get the feeling of what a peace angel really was. The first one footer that you see there, I think probably is about 10 street weapons in it, and it's made of nuclear missiles, it was poured in 1997. So we gave one to Rudolph Giuliani after 9 11. President Clinton had received the first one. And people started to kind of catch on to what a peace angel it had to be in a place that meant something. It had to take a stand for what human beings maybe couldn't at the time. Maybe they couldn't have possibly done. So the Peace Angel for the September 11th Museum, now owned by the museum, will go there um, in April when the museum opens and will be in our exhibition in September here in San Francisco so people can see. Now we have a uh, peace angel in Africa, peace angel in New York at the 9 11 Museum, and the California peace angel, that one that's on the left hand side, is the one foot model of the downtown Los Angeles monument. We don't know what the size is going to be, but we do know that we'll do a California campaign of 30 maybe 100,000 weapons that will go into it. And the monument, the discussions are, should it be 30 or 100 feet? The Statue of Liberty is 150 feet. The base would be 50 feet, the sculpture would be 100 feet. So now we're in the realm of talking about a statue in California that could be like the West Coast Statue of Liberty and do a campaign to request weapons from maybe the whole state, maybe the whole country. I also know a lot of people internationally that would like to send those weapons here. So a couple of months, no, I think it was uh, 2008, excuse me, I started to go to the United Nations for the biennial uh, meetings on small arms and light weapons. It was a meeting of great countries, all the countries in the world. And it was um, a <laughs> social, social justice organizations that were, like we just read about those people, right? They were all there. And they started these discussions and invited me to these meetings. And I was the only artist there. So 2008, then 2010, then by 2012, it kind of morphed into the arms trade treaty. So now knowing what my vision is and the things that are in place, right, I went to these meetings, very humbly again, because you're with the diplomats, the attorneys, I mean, this is everybody. And I decided to be very quiet and listen, just listen. Am I pissed off that people are dying? Yes. Am I really, really going to get this done no matter what? No matter what? Yes. <laughs> but I wanted to go listen. Because I wanted to find out what I didn't know that I didn't know. And as I went to the arms trade treaty and listened, the way it works is that every single country on earth and the ones that don't have them want them. And the ones who can't get them are either going to make them or get them illegally. Because if you have a country and you don't have any weapons and people know it, you're not going to be a country all that long. So I got to watch the ebb and flow of what really is peace. What really happens when we're talking about war? What really is our country doing? I'm an American, I wanted to know. And how does the rest of the world see us? And what about the small arms problem that we have? And I can tell you one thing that I learned that was shocking 
is that nobody knows what's going on. There isn't one country, there isn't one group, nobody knows what's going on. And to make it even worse, most people are arguing about what they do know, what they think is going to work, but isn't going to work quite. Well. And when I walked away with that feeling, all these people, these great people that believe in these things project, what I walked away from that feeling was that it was going to take a lot of us and a lot of different parts of things. It was going to take a lot of respect, a great deal of discipline. And it was going to take extraordinary steps. Because dialogue to dialogue is just dialogue. It doesn't change the language. And if I believed in the Peace Angels Project before I went to those meetings, I walked out of there knowing that I had to get this done. Knowing that when you put it up, there's going to be miracles. And that is a big deal. Because we can't keep talking about how bad it is. We have to start realizing the futures and thinking, what do we have to give to our young people? We cannot leave it this way. At least I can. I don't know. But I don't think that we can. Because young people don't have the life expectancy that we do. There's all kinds of challenges. And as our human race goes further, the biggest problem is that we're going to have ecological challenges. And if we aren't getting along well enough, we're going to miss out on how do you solve those problems. Someone in a different country would have an answer. We don't know because we just killed them. Some neighbor doesn't like somebody else. You kill each other, you lose those people. And I really believe, quite honestly, that with the challenges that we have coming, the last thing we do is fight with each other. We need to be <coughs> So the peace angels stand for miracles. They stand for magic. And I know what it feels like to be standing in the peace angels. And I know what happens. But most people don't yet. A few years ago when we started the Angel of Peace Award, which is an award to honor people with extreme good in Los Angeles, some of the founders, we had these billboards on the whispers of the angels all over LA. And I was always very humble because those heroes that are dealing with kids and you know dying and all this stuff, it's it's pretty heavy. And what I do, I love my work. Um, humbly speaking, I just yeah, thought it was all right to be last. So as I was standing there, um, and the politicians are being interviewed on camera, this one politician, very powerful guy, steps up and he puts his hand on the peace angel. It was the Mexico peace angel at the time. And I know the man didn't mean to do this, but he burst into tears on the camera. Because when he put his hand on the peace angel, it was a different experience. He could feel the energy. He could feel what was happening. And something in him just, just shifted. And when you talk about doing a city with 100,000 weapons and possibly, you know, 100 feet tall, that's a lot of power. It's a lot of comprehension. And I think it might change people's minds. And we don't know. We really don't know um, whose mind needs to be changed or what needs to change and happen. None of us do. But it's a vote toward a better world. It's a, it's a happy vote. <coughs> now, artists are very interesting people. So I apologize for that at a time. <laughs> but we have a way of being inspired. I always say artists uh, pick up the visceral nerve and come back. We capture lightning. It's a very different kind. So the inspiration that I had um, was very evocative and caused me to change the way I saw the world and to see my position in it. And what it taught me was that um, each one of us has to take our own step toward making this a better world. I can tell you that I will do the Peace Angels Project to the last breath. 
I will get this done one way or the other. But I think every single person on earth wants to make this a better place because you can't just keep going like this. The Arms Trade Treaty, they said there were millions of small arms in that office. Millions. Don't get me wrong. I am telling you this as people, most people I don't even know, I'm going to say. I don't believe that we can go without protection. I don't believe that for a second. We're not in a position in, in the world, the world is not that same place. So how we solve all, all of these things is going to take partnership. And it's going to take work. It's going to take miracles. So this is my map. <laughs> of where I would like to see peace angels uh, exist. I could consider them acupuncture points on the globe. <laughs> and acupuncturers usually go in at the most critical junctures, places where the most toxicity is. When we do Buenos Aires as opposed to some other you know, area, there is already one in Johannesburg. Will we have them in Baghdad? And some of these areas, if it's not there, I would like it to be close. Somewhere along these paths, having the peace angels capture the weapons and take a stand. I used to say to people when they interviewed me that where they stood, there was a war. But that was good enough. But this is the map. We have one, um, that little one is for Los Angeles. New York has uh, one at the World Trade Center, although we've been invited to place a peace angel at such an honorable place in New York, it's, it's stunning. Um, Commissioner Kelly asked me to put one in front of the Joint Operations Unit at one police plaza. Now what the Joint Operations Unit is, it's almost incomprehensible. After 9-11, the NYPD, what was left of it, um, really pulled together on protecting New York and this country, right? It's like the gateway to the rest of the country in a lot of ways. So they asked me to put a peace angel right at the place where President Obama, counterterrorism units, uh, soldiers from Israel, Balkans, the Orient, where they all go in to make decisions on how to safeguard our country. Can you imagine? So as each person would walk in, they would see our peace angel, which kind of would stand there to remind them, this is a no crap line here. This is where we really do have to protect our country. And we really, really do have to be smart about it. What a sight, huh? Because see, a peace angel to me isn't a peace angel unless the sight that it's in is an important and transformational place. It's not just the angel. It's not just the weapons. But it's the place that it goes. That together, that's a peace angel. Um, Washington, D.C., we don't have one yet, but I have very big plans and very good contacts. So I'm looking forward to what we can do in Washington. Jerusalem, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been invited. I can't even tell you by all sides. I look very forward to that. Moscow, we got invitations. Uh, Sarajevo, Museum, Museum of Contemporary Art. And I don't think there's an Irish person in New York that doesn't want me to do the Belfast Peace Angel. <laughs> I've had a few invitations. So that's the Jerusalem Peace Angel. That's one thing I've done. And that's something about me. Um, I don't know what else I can say except that um, it's an honor to work on the Peace Angel. It's an honor to open up that mission of possibility.
I think that um, I should tell you a little bit about the art that's created around it. Like Derek Cabana is my art dealer, who I am crazy about because he's sharp and because he can handle something like this. This is not an easy thing to handle. You saw the sculptures, one foot. On this side, the smaller one was done in 1997. I was there, so was CNN. The weapons were melted, there was no dry eye in the place. Cameras all got shut off because the toxins from the gun metal, which is horrible, closed everything down. And President Clinton was the first, very first one, just out of the foundry, was secreted away by the Secret Service directly to President Clinton, who was in office. The other piece angel was done in 2011, uh, with the design for Los Angeles, which is a female, as opposed to the male for New York and has the children, because again, the loss of life <coughs> behind the children is stunning. And the city council, when they asked me why I wanted to put the seal of Los Angeles on the front, I said, because you guys have lost thousands of children, and it's the power of place. That's why the seal is there. So that's the one that should be about um, 100 feet, 30 to 100 feet. But this work of art here represents the thousands and thousands of works of art that I've done in the 21 years today of the Peace Angels Project. What's unusual about that peace sign, I've done a million of them, as well as many, many of the drawings, is that that one is one of the first ones that has the weapons included. So 21 years ago, I didn't know how to do that. And I didn't have the contents, but now I do. And this peace angel has nuclear stains in it. The two-dimensional art is important because it tells the journey, tells the, the whole story. And the sculptures have far less than the watercolors and drawings. Next year, um, September 2014, we're going to have the first exhibition in San Francisco at Reverie Arts of the story of the Peace Angels Project. It will be amazing. I hope you can all come. But the uh, smaller pieces are important to me because they capture every day, every single day, what's going on, who am I talking to, what's, what's the movement, what's, what's the, what are the thoughts, the formulas. On the tech side, just for a minute, uh, the Peace Angels Project is a very, very technical thing. It doesn't, uh, it's not like other works of art. It has weapons that have to be poured together. You have formulas from the Swedish Corrosion Institute in Stockholm. You have sculptures tested in the Getty Museum. These tests are very important because I get to either put up a silver peace angel where you all see a reflection and you feel uplifted, or the corrosion will eat away at the sculpture. And first it'll turn red, then it'll turn black, and then it'll just disappear. So it's the opposite message. It's not even like it would be okay, no, because it's the opposite message. So a lot of work goes on in testing, in weapons testing, metal testing, Enjoyable. It's a so, These are some of the people that have supported the Peace Angels Project. And Father Greg Boyle texted me the other day when I told him I was going to be here. And he said, be sure to say hello for him at to mention Homeboy Industries. Mm -hmm. You guys know about Homeboy Industries? That's very cool. So when I met Father Greg Boyle in 1990, as I was driving around LA doing my research, and someone told me to go see him, I had this kind of little baby chip on my shoulder, this little thing one, mm -hmm. because I didn't want anybody to like me or like this project because of my family. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. But my uncle, Father Stephen Olivo, a dean of students, wonderful, wonderful man. Um, was really good friends with Father Greg Boyle. 
And I didn't want Greg to like the Peace Angels Project because of that. So for about five years, he didn't know what my uncle was, who he was. And it was people like Father Greg, Billy Weiss, Paul Cummins, Sheriff Baca. Those are all LA people. And then the, the New Yorkers who came in who actually helped um, work with them. I mean, right now, Father Greg would like to have a piece in the monument in his, um, in his real estate. I don't know what that's going to happen. But great, great, great support. This page is probably the most important page on this document, and probably my favorite page to show you. Because as I stand here on my own, speaking for, <laughs> I don't know, an hour. Um, I don't stand here alone. These people have all been on the phone with me, have all worked with me, have all spent hours with me, have all made decisions with me, have all cried with me. These are people who have been involved in the Peace Angels Project in a big way. There are so many more people that are not on this page, but these are the important ones, the ones who have stayed, the ones who, who are still working on this. Sandy Rivkin, <coughs> one little tiny name on there, has worked with me since the year 2000. Volunteer. Smart woman. So this does not happen alone. This is a very telling page because it shows the people who have a lot invested in getting this piece in this project accomplished. And most of them are from the uh, production side, but some of them are from the political side. Respectfully, it's, it's a good picture. These are some of the people that have won Peace Angel Awards. So, um, 1994, I was going back and forth to Los Angeles, and I didn't have the money at the time to pour the sculptures. So Piero Musi at Musi Artworks Foundry, nicely enough, poured them in wax. And I drove them down, that's <laughs> I drove them down to LA. They were gonna have a big rally. And I had done all my research about Los Angeles, 135 languages spoken, it was amazing anybody got along, right? So I go to this big thing, one of the very first ones, and I put up the waxes, of course, in the hot sun, why right not? But what I took for granted in the art world was not met with the same kind of calm by these heroes who went out into the street and saved lives of them. And as I was sitting there, again, like a politician putting his hand on the peace angel, I'm watching these people, and they're like crying, they're standing in front of the sculptures. I was like, I, I, I didn't really get this surprise. So this one woman got up on the stage, and she said, there's one person here who's not up on the stage who needs to be. And she mentioned my name, which I was horrified. I'd never given any speeches at that time. And when she came to me afterwards, she said, Lynn, I have a big feeling. I know what this Peace Angels Project is all about. And I said, what? She said it's about love, real love. I was kind of surprised that anybody got it. She asked me, she said, you know, I want to do an award for, for the people who do this kind of work. And I said, you mean the heroes? And she said, yeah. I said, all right, here's the deal. You do all the structural work, because I knew I wasn't going to be able to. I was traveling all the time, moving. I said, you get the structure in place and I'll bring the Peace Angels. And that's what we did. And so many of these people have won that Peace Angel Award. Amelia Mon March has won. Um, Michael Moore with Bowling for Columbine. They focus mostly on guns. So the Peace Angels with them are, are just made of guns. But you can't buy those. You have to earn them. So, these are people who are out in the world who have a peace angel and who um, are heroes, I think, some of them. Okay, 
Okay, so I think I told you about the California Peace Angel, and uh, I'll, I'll go into the design if we have a few minutes. <laughs> um, Los Angeles, and specifically California overall, is the United States of the United States. It's almost like someone took a shaker, and all the people came from the East Coast and came from the Orient, it just kind of collected everyone. And it was supposed to be a place of plenty. Remember the orchards around here, beauty? Well, the death toll in Los Angeles is in the hundreds of thousands. And it's only one of those places I've stopped. And kind of that promise of the plentitude, the cornucopia of good, has been in this nowhere somewhere, maybe to the life. And that struggle of remembering the dream and remembering the promise is what the California Peace Angel is. She's a female and she holds her children. And funny, funny, funny <laughs> thing here, it's something I just find very ironic. When I was at the Arms Trade Treaty, I met with a woman who was responsible for keeping the Second Amendment in our Constitution, which means that we can bear arms. She at first didn't want to speak to me because she didn't, you know, she was, I think, so used to getting land. But I told her, I said, I have no agenda. I'm an artist. I want to understand what you did. I want to understand why you did it, if you don't mind. So she and I finally sat down, and the thing that just, it, the whole thing always blows my mind. I said, why did you do it? She said, Lynn, when weapons are taken, whether it's from a war or negative, the people who are left behind are the women and the elderly and the children. And who's going to protect them? I said, it's all right. So I'm doing the Peace Angels Project. What's important to you in the symbol? She had not seen the sculpture. She hadn't seen any picture. She said it should be a mother. She should be holding her children. Same thing. But the thing that's different in the, the monument will show. She said she wanted the right hand just like giving life and self-protection. It's an amazing symbol. I was so honored to do it. I had no idea it was going to land on the 21st of it. I mean, today is the Tuesday, 21 years ago, that I saw what I saw. And I saw seven angels for two hours. Um, the room was like jello. I got out of the way. I've never experienced anything like that before, and I'm sure that I very strict uh, as some. And see, as an artist, um, even my intelligent mind <laughs> questions everything. Um, it's just the artist side is so strong that it's just like, just chill and just take down the information. And that's why I saw, uh, that's why I got the inspiration for the imagery. And I didn't see them, and they moved, and it was very powerful. So that kind of inference you know, when I had that happen, I felt like, I told my friends, it felt like my makeup was on for you. You know, you walk out of there and you're like, you know, like, you look out and my whole life has changed. And um, when I saw them, I couldn't deny it. It's like that thing in uh, Contact with Joey Fisher where she says, I'd like to tell you it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And the images of the art were so strong that I had to throw away everything that I had done before. Everything. I couldn't even answer the phone in the three hours. I couldn't go to museums. I had to stop. And for two years, I started to redraw and draw and sculptures. Any other questions? Come on, you guys. It's amazing. Make <laughs> one up. All right. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I had the thought that, well, this is wonderful. We're going to have these peace angels throughout the world. And they're going to be sourced from weapons of killing. And then I said, well, I wonder if the power of the peace angel will reach those who make so much money in producing weapons? And will there be an end somehow 
to the production of weapons, and do you see that as part of your vision? Well, I can answer that, actually. I spent a couple of months with some of the biggest weapons dealers in the world. I actually sat next to them just because I wanted to at the arms trade treaty, much to the chagrin of the Red Cross and Oxfam and all those guys who thought it came out. But I wanted to know, I wanted to hear, I wanted to look what they had to say. And they took me to lunch on my birthday last year. I said, how do you like it? I was going to have lunch with the war mongers. And I, I'll say the same thing to you that I said to them, again, this is 2013, we are here. We are not at 2015 or 3,000 or whatever. We are not here. And we cannot go without protection. That being said, hopefully the Peace Angels Project operates in ways that are beyond, I would say art is beyond the constraints of the world. And I expect that things will happen that we can't understand. But I can tell you this, which I thought was very hopeful. They all wanted to support me. They all wanted to give weapons for the exhibitions. They asked me if I wanted tanks and helicopters. I mean, at least I got their respect and I got their ear. And they'll take my call. And those are things, that was like, if I could get that far, that was a good day. That was a good couple of years, actually. And another thing, too, that you bring up that um, I should bring up is that our government, right, is very um, besieged for many, every reason. And um, I, I really liked our, our delegation. I, I listened to them, I heard them, I sat on the outskirts. I, I did something I don't like to do. I kind of like listened in because I wanted to know. So I had asked, I would, I would make, how it worked was, I would make art every day. And then uh, the head of international action that was on small arms, Michelle Polakoff, told the young women that were the reporters that I was making this art every day, recording what was happening in the room. So every day they decided they wanted my art for their magazine. So every night I would go home, I would do the art, put it in my pajamas wherever I was staying, finish the art, take a picture with God bless the iPhone, send it directly to the press, and the next morning that art went to me the entire world, everything. So little by little, the reason I'm bringing that up is because little by little they got to know me and they got to trust me and it made it easier for me to interview certain countries and certain people. We get to the absolute last day and here comes the United States government, which I had asked them if I was being scared and I said I was getting the point that it wasn't me. I mean these guys were, everybody wants to be scared. So, he came, the head of the delegation came up to me, I think I was falling asleep, it was like the, that was the last day. And he said, oh Lynn, we loved your drawings of the, you know, the Hiroshima bomb, you know, it was up on the big screens and we all got to see it. And I was like, okay, you know, I, just, I figured he was going to say, <laughs> you know, what you did. He said, um, I can't put you in the room. There's too much going on. And I said, yeah, I got it, okay, it's fine. You guys are great. It's an honor just to be here. He said, so I want you to come to Washington. And I want you to interview me in Washington. I, you could have knocked me over with the I was, I was so shocked. So we did. Last November, I toddled my way down from New York City to Washington. We had our appointment at a restaurant where my godson, David Edmondson, had recommended a restaurant. And we get there, and half the restaurant had to be cleared away so I could speak with this man. He spoke to me for two hours with me drawing and him speaking. And when we were done, and he told me some remarkable things, all captured in the art. I said, you know, you guys are great. I mean, is there anything that I should tell people? He said, yeah. He said, please tell people that some really good people are trying to fix this. And that's why I would tell people. So now I have weapons dealers that I can talk to about weapons. They'll take my phone call and have a meeting with me. And I have contacts with the US government. I have several. So, okay. 
Um, what do you think the individuals here in this room could do to take away individually and take action on an individual basis that would facilitate this process continuing? Well, it depends. Goodbye, Art. You could speak to me or Derek about funding uh, the monuments. You could spread the word. You can like the artist Facebook page. Yeah. You can do a lot of things. You can just talk about it. You can take as an example of what I'm doing and do something yourself. Those are some things people can do. But I do ha I do know how we can fund the big one in the money. I know that we can fund it with uh, sponsors who want what they call serious signage. That means, you know name on them for the rest of eternity. But I also want to do coins, little pieces for everybody to have, because not everybody can afford to be large for the public software, which I wish they would. I'd like to do things that everybody can be a part of the same project. I'd like to do a coin made of gold or silver or platinum, with also with the, the um, metals on it, which I've been doing money, you know, pieces that to spread. You know, so many people have a heart. So many amazing people. And if I've heard it once, I've, I've heard it a million times, that having it there holds the space for making it better world. And I really love that. Mm -hmm. So, I'm trying to think of how to phrase my question because I have a million questions for you. Um, but I guess trying to you know visualize how these will work out in the future. Um, do you think that it's going to be the message behind the angel that will kind of try and change how humanity works, or is it the angel itself? What what is your mission with the angel? Because I. I but you have, to, you have to know that the art is very mysterious. Mm -hmm. it's, the real art has electromagnetic energy. So it has electricity. It's not a human thing by the means, but it has electricity. It's not like a friend or something that is uh, removed from the process. So I, ca I can tell you my intention, but I have a really strong feeling that that's only my intention, that the art itself will weigh me out. Because I'm going to live, I don't know, what, 100 more years? <laughs> it's very limited time. And beyond that, that art is going to stay there. And it's going to speak to me. That's the hope and the dream. Do you know that in my research, years ago, there was only one piece monument, and that was done in Persia sometime in the BC time period. And it was made of swords. That was it. I think there are a few now, but not that many. And you want to do something prominent like this, you know, my idea, my thought was, do, you know, it was Congresswoman Hahn that asked me to do West Coast Central with the idea. I don't know if that's the way it is. But all I know is that with my research with her, Ellis Island has a very small amount of people that came to it. Very few. And the Americans that have come to this country are everything from the Native Americans that came 40,000 years ago to more people coming into this country now than have ever come to it. Ever. I don't know if you know that. There's more people coming into this country now than ever in history. And they're not represented anywhere. And I think it would be so cool to have them take a vote for peace and put their name up and do the 100 foot line and go to the base in California that stands for peace and have everyone's voice be a part of it. This is my kind of quiet wish. So as of now, it's based on funding that you need to be able to do this. Partnership. 
Wouldn't it be great if everybody was part of it? Even if we didn't need any money at all. The people to be a part of it. So they can go home and they can say, I'm a part of it. That's the That's the conception of it. There should be no saying that there is an important site or a big plan. Yeah, I'm just curious how long these pieces take you. Sculptures. Oh, okay. That little one footer took me a year. The big piece angel that we had up in the very beginning, uh, that took me like eight months. They all take a long time. That's why I say the individual watercolors and drawings you know, are like on a regular basis, but the sculptures take a long time. I have a question. How are the sculptures made? Are they made out of clay? Or? They're made out of glass. I'm sorry? Glass. Okay, so one more. If there's no more, then I have a question for you. And, and actually for Derek as well. Um, <laughs> I would like to know, we have an audience here primarily of, of Santa Clara students. Um, so they're at a very formative point in their lives. And, and these, this is the next generation that will go forward. And I'm wondering what you as an artist, as a creative person, a thinker, um, as a human, would tell them. And then after that, I wonder, Derek, what would you like our audience to take away about Lynn and your relationship as her representative? That's a good question. Okay, so um, students, hear my words. Forget me, but hear these words. Think. Be engaged. Be awake. Pay attention. Doesn't matter if someone's criticizing you, complimenting you. Doesn't matter where you get the information. Own it. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Because with that confidence and your ability to take that information in, you will do great things. There's no way around it. Don't go into the world blaming other people. It's a waste of time. Take ownership of your life. The sooner the better. And that will give you the life that you want. Okay. Um, I think what, what we do different with uh, with Reverie Arts is, is, is all of my artists, at least probably 85% of them, I've known for at least two years. And we just were at uh, San Francisco Art Institute where we did an event with some graduate students, some students who are still in their undergrad. And the, the question that came up more often than anything is how do we get representation? And what I would always push back and say, you choose who represents you and make that a very very special relationship because that person is your voice, is your character, and is someone who's representing you when you're not there. Take the time to get to know that individual, spend time with them to have conversations. You're literally bringing someone into your family. Um, and do not, do not stop with rejection. Do not stop, keep pushing, because you're going to find a person who you're going to collaborate with who is going to understand your voice, understand your vision, and it, it's a partnership. I mean, I've fortunately met Lynn a year and a half, almost two years ago, for us to begin this process. And it takes time. Don't give up. You believe in what you're doing, have conviction, and keep finding the person that will represent you. Is that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to thank Lynn and Derek for your time. And to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to be with us. I do encourage you, if you have not already done so, to please and come and take a look at the works um, in person because they're stunning um, as you get close to them. So thank you both for being here. I greatly appreciate it.